जाएंगे हम अपने हिंद बनाएंगे हम दहली दहली जाएंगे हम अपने हिंद बनाएंगे अफौज बन के रहना है दुख दर्द मुसीबत सहना है अफौज बन के रहना है दुख दर्द मुसीबत सहना है सुभाष का कहना कहना है चलो दहली चल के रहना है एज प्रोमिस्ड ड्यूरिंग द अर्ली डेज ऑफ इज अराइवल नेताजी अनाउंस द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ द प्रोविजनल गवर्नमेंट ऑफ आजाद हिंद दिस वॉज डन ऑन द ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट अक्टूबर नाइनटीन फोर्टी थ्री एट द कैथे सिनेमा बिल्डिंग द एम द गोल वॉज टू ड्राइव आर द ब्रिटिश एंड फॉर्म अ परमानेंट आजाद हिंद गवर्नमेंट इन इंडिया अकॉर्डिंग टू द विल ऑफ द पीपल इन इंडिया इट वुड हैव टू बी अ पॉपुलर गवर्नमेंट इन जॉइंग द कॉन्फिडेंस ऑफ द पीपल नेताजी टूक द ओथ ऑफ एलिजियंस टू इंडिया एज द हेड ऑफ स्टेट एज द प्राइम मिनिस्टर एज द मिनिस्टर फॉर वॉर the foreign minister and the supreme commander of the INA the azad hind government was headquartered in singapore and consisted of five ministers uh, eight representatives from the INA and five representatives civilian advisers representing the civilian population in east and southeast asia the first decision of the provisional government of azad hind was to declare war on britain and the us netaji declared this decision in a public rally of around 50000 indians on the 23rd the japanese government recognized announced their recognition of the azadin government which was immediately followed by recognition by eight more countries imon de valera president of the irish free state sent his personal congratulations to netaji one thing that netaji achieved at this juncture was his long cherished dream of creating a fighting force of indian women what started in 1928 the calcutta congress of 1928 now got a concrete shape by the formation of the rani jhansi regiment there was resistance on part of the japanese they were not very happy to uh, allow a uh, fighting regiment uh, comprising only women but as usual they had to give way to netaji's dogged perseverance and convincing power the training camp for the uh, regiment was opened on 22nd october between 500 to 1000 women joined the training camps those who were fit for fighting became non commissioned officers and the others who were who were not fit for fighting they took up support roles hum bharat ke bete hain hum bharat ke bete hain ab utha chuki talwar hum bharat ke bete hain ab utha chuki talwar hum bharat हम मरने से नहीं डरती हम मरने से नहीं डरती नहीं पीछे पाओ को धरती नहीं पीछे पाओ द रेजिमेंट वॉज लेटर सेंट टू द बामा फ्रंट वेन द फाइटिंग वॉज गोइंग ऑन प्रिपरेशन वे गोइंग ऑन एंड थिंग्स वेर टेकिंग शेप बट अदर देन आर्म्स एंड एमिनेशन the major headache was finance the big question was how to raise this money where would it come from one avenue of course was the japanese government and the japanese government agreed to pay for the maintenance of the uh, prisoners of war the soldiers recruited from among the prisoners of war and the maintenance of the prisoners of war but for everything else netaji took the responsibility of meeting the expenditures at his own effort there was no new arms and ammunition they were coming from the stock of the captured british arms netaji's call for total mobilization resulted in raising of around 1.5 million dollars uh, till july 1943 and between july and october 4 million more was raised but this was clearly not enough as we see from contemporary documents that expenditure on account of the indian independence league just for the month of october just that one month was a million dollars so if the expenditure for a month was a million dollars only for iil obviously this money was not going to suffice uh, netaji needed more money 
so he went back to the indian people in the in the region in eastern southeast asia and made it clear that they cannot shirk their responsibility to the country's freedom it was a time of war and it was not ordinary peace time and their resources were at the command of the government of the azadin government this bore fruit his personal appeal and his exhortations yielded result just over two days on 25th and 26th of october in 1943 20 million malayan dollars were raised in singapore alone a new board for management of organizing funds was set up and uh, indians were required to declare their assets to this board levies collected uh, varied from 10 to 20 percent of the assets the next step again in the face of a uh, strong japanese opposition was to set up the national bank of azadind this was done to get over the financial dependence on japan the money that japan gave for the ina netaji made it very clear that this was not donation or charity this was treated as a loan which would be paid back when india became free and as netaji went on uh, raising funds he tried to pay back the german government and to some extent the japanese government in whatever small amounts he could from the uh, for the for the help that they had uh, given soon after announcing the formation of the government netaji again left for tokyo to attend the greater east asia conference uh, on november 5th and 6th he went as an observer in tokyo in his discussions with uh, the japanese leaders he again argued for greater financial and military help for the ina and then netaji did something which was new and uh, completely unexpected uh, by the japanese it was unheard of and never considered that it could have been possible he asked uh for the control for the handover of the control of uh evacuee properties of indians in burma because when the bum uh, burma was started a lot of indians left burma for india and left behind a lot of property and assets so netaji wanted the control the handover of this property to the indian to, to the azadin government to this tojo agreed moreover tojo agreed to hand over uh indian territory under japanese control netaji was however very keen to have uh, control over some indian territory over which the azadin government could claim sovereignty and at that moment the only indian territory under the japanese control were the andaman and nicobar islands netaji pushed very hard for it naturally there was opposition from the japanese side particularly the japanese navy opposed it to the nail they were not willing to hand over these strategic islands to the azadin government but netaji's insistence again won the day the japanese government agreed to hand over the jurisdiction of the island to the azadin government this move was announced by tojo on the second day of the greater east asia conference uh, as an evidence of japanese willingness to help to provide all help to the indian movement Netaji visited Port Blair in December and a ceremonial handover took place. He raised the national flag on the island, renamed them as uh, Shaheed and Swaraj and placed Lieutenant Colonel Loganathan as the chief commissioner of the in charge of the administration. The full transfer handover of the administration however never took place. Apart from this Netaji also extracted some significant concessions from the uh, Japanese government using his personal influence. on the senior ministers and the leaders in the armed forces and for the first time the ina was given the status of an allied and equal army no more was it under japanese control this is the most significant development that demolishes the propaganda that the ina was under the control of the japanese he also got the uh, agreement from the japanese government to raise a second division and st- also start planning for a third division because his idea was to create a full scale army of 3 lakhs and 50000 people were only the 50000 troops were only the immediate goal 
but the number had to go up to 3 lakhs. So a second division was needed, a third division was needed. Moreover, he also got the Japanese government to agree to his proposal to have the uh, INA cadets trained in the Imperial War College. So this was a very successful trip to Tokyo. Now it was time to return to the base, to the headquarters and start preparing for the war. The time for actual war, the time for actual participation of the INA in the war was fast approaching. As the monsoon broke in 1942, the advancing Japanese forces uh, reached the Chindwin uh, River near the Indian frontier and halted there. And as they halted there, the depleted and demoralized British Indian Army and Indians in Burma practically dragged themselves somehow into the Indian territory of Assam and Manipur states. The Japanese had greatly extended their line of supply. It was a very difficult terrain. So they had greatly extended their line of supply and they also halted to regroup and reorganize their supply lines. There were proposals in 1942 to push ahead into Indian territory, but that plan somehow got postponed indefinitely. And that delay gave the British forces the time to rethink, to regroup and to consider what needed to be done to defeat the Japanese forces in Burma. Throughout 1943, intense discussions went on among the Japanese as to how to move forward, when to move forward and what exactly needed to be done. And during this time, the Japanese forces were also reorganized in the Burma region. A new headquarters, the Burma Area Army, was created under Lieutenant General Masakazu Kawabe. The main force that would be responsible for the thrust towards uh, the Imphal campaign was, its, uh, was the subordinate force of the Burma Area Army, the 15th Army. Lieutenant General Renia Mutaguchi was appointed to command this 15th army in March 1943. Both Field Marshal Terauchi and uh, Lieutenant General Katakura, uh, staff officer to the 15th army and also known as the Tiger of Burma, were apprehensive. They were not uh, quite convinced. They were skeptical about the move uh, to the, towards the forward thrust into uh, Imphal. But Lieutenant General Mutaguchi argued in favor. He pushed for it. He said that the uh, problems of supplies and transport could be taken care of. After many debates, Prime Minister Tojo finally gave the go-ahead to the Imphal campaign from his bath in December 1943. Immediately, Netaji moved the Azadin government, the headquarters of the Azadin government and the INA headquarters from Singapore to Rangoon, closer to the front. The number one regiment under Shanwas Khan also moved to uh, Burma towards the end of uh, 1943. But problem was brewing with the Hikari Kikan. Netaji was not at all happy with the uh, attitude of Colonel Yamamoto. And eventually, Colonel Yamamoto was replaced by Lieutenant General Isoda Saburo as the head of the Hikari Kikan. General Isoda's responsibility now was to maintain liaison between the Southern Army, the Burma Area Army, the 15th Army uh, beneath it, and the Azadin government and the INA. The Hikari Kikan was augmented. New departments were added to be, make it, to enable it uh, to do its job more efficiently. All intelligence gathering units were now brought under the control of the INA, the command of the INA. And it was decided that after the fall of Manipur, 
the territory would be jointly defended by the INA and the Japanese army, but the administration of the territory would be in the hands of the Azadin government. To be able to do this, to be able to administer the liberated areas, Netaji set up something called the Azadin Dal, a cadre of administrative and service uh, officers trained by uh, Lieutenant Colonel A.C. Chatterjee. The Azadin Dal was to follow the INA closely and uh, to take charge of the territories as the Japanese and the INA uh, drove out the Britishers. The first regiment under Shanwas Khan was put under the operational command of uh, the Burma Area Army, but Netaji insisted and obtained the concession that the first regiment would be given an independent sector to operate, an independent area to fight its battle. So, the Hakka Falam area was allocated to the 1st Regiment, the Subhash Regiment uh, to for the, for the, for in, in this Imphal campaign. The terrain was inhospitable, the climate nightmarish, supplies were grossly inadequate and whatever supplies uh, reached the front were largely gathered by the, largely taken over by the Japanese forces. And Netaji had to fight for every bit of the supplies to be given to the INA. It was not easy. It was extremely, it was an extremely complicated and difficult situation. And then there was the case of numerical superiority of the British forces. By one estimate of the total Japanese troops of say around 95,000, only 8,000 belonged to the INA. And these combined 95,000 troops were fighting against a British uh, force of 1,55,000 troops. The Japanese military campaign uh, in 1944 directed towards India consisted of two campaigns in two different sectors, the Arakan Hills and Imphal. While the Arakan campaign had started towards the beginning of 1944, the Imphal campaign was delayed although the go-ahead had been given by uh, Prime Minister Tojo at the end of 1943. The Imphal and Kohima campaign could start only towards the beginning of March 1944. The dreaded monsoons were just two months away. There was very little time for the Imphal campaign to be successful. The Arakan campaign started in January 1944 and was carried out by the 55th Japanese Division. The aim of this campaign was to make it look like the main and real attack into India, whereas in reality it was only a sideshow, uh, trying to pin down the British forces in this sector and uh, to draw the reserves here in this part. The campaign however failed. It failed to make the British retreat or surrender due to the air superiority of the British forces. Thus, the initial success which the Japanese had seen in this sector was gone. The main Japanese campaign which was against Imphal and Kohima was to start within a month of the Arakan campaign but it took longer. Three times larger than the Arakan campaign, the Imphal campaign was to be carried out by three Japanese divisions. The idea was to isolate and destroy the allied forces in the forward uh, positions and then capture Imphal. The campaign was named Operation You Go. The Japanese forces which went into this operation were the 33rd Infantry Division, which aimed to surround and destroy the 17th Indian Division at Tidim and then attack Imphal from the south. The Yamamoto force, named after Major General Sunoru Yamamoto, would destroy the 20th Indian Division at Tamu, then attack Imphal from the east. The 15th Infantry Division would envelop Imphal from the north. This division was still arriving from road building duties in Thailand and was under strength at the start of the operation. In a separate subsidiary operation, the 31st Infantry Division would isolate Imphal by capturing Kohima on the Imphal Dimapur road and then advance to Dimapur. Now, what was INA's role in this whole operation in the Arakan campaign and the Imphal campaign? It has been fashionable among the intelligentsia in our country 
even after so many years to describe ina as a ragtag army as a sub an uh, as an army subsidiary to the japanese and uh, having played no significant role in the war the point of being subsidiary to the japanese have been demolished we know now that they were fighting as equal armies as allied armies and as far as being a ragtag army is concerned it's a shame to even talk in those terms because here were soldiers who under terrible conditions terribly under supplied and fighting in a completely inhospitable zone without heavy artillery without assured supply lines without assured transport lacking food and medicines they were going all ahead to fight for their motherland to use derogatory terms for such brave hearts is a shame on ourselves was ina's role significant did the soldiers of the indian national army prove themselves did they achieve anything significant yes they did let's take a look at what the role of the ina was and what they did attached with the 55th japanese division was a unit of bahadur group about 200 strong under major misra a unit of the 55th japanese cavalry regiment together with the 1st battalion of subhash regiment was to check the 81st west africa division which was advancing down the banks of the kaladan river the other two battalions of subhash regiment were in charge of the hakafalam sector the movement of the three battalions of the 1st regiment had started from rangoon on 4th february by the beginning of march 1944 the 81st west african division was swiftly approaching a position from which it might constitute a threat to the whole japanese position in the arakan the number 1 battalion established its base at kyoktau in the middle of march and after some skirmishes had established itself at temta a place south of kaladan with the japanese reinforcement coming from arakan the battalion pushed northward taking kaladan palitwa dalitme and eventually modok a place on the indian side of the indo burma border a part of the ina battalion continued to be at modok up to september 1944 however on the india burma border the numerically weak japanese land forces which had cut off and surrounded the british 5th and the 7th divisions not only failed to overwhelm them as being supplied by air they held their ground but due to their own logistical weakness had no alternative but to fall back the threat to the arakan front thus having been removed the british divisions on this front were freed to be shifted later to the more seriously threatened four british corps struggling against the main japanese attack against imphal the transfer of troops from one sector to the other was made possible only by allied air superiority In the Imphal campaign two battalions of the 1st regiment and two special units were to join the Japanese forces from the beginning of the campaign and two other regiments of the number no. 1 INA division reinforced them in April and May the two battalions of the 1st regiment in the Hakafalam sector was led by Shanawaz Khan by March 15 the 2nd and 3rd guerrilla regiments of the INA 2000 strong reached rangoon from malaya netaji persuaded lieutenant general kaobe to allow these two regiments to join the 15th army as they were operating against a superior force and the battle worthiness of the ina had been proved in the arakan campaign the second and third regiments were sent to reinforce the yamamoto detachment ordered to take the tamu and palel airfield colonel mz kiani commander of number no. 1 ina division set up his divisional headquarters at chamol on 17th april 1944 the regimental headquarters of the second regiment was established at kanjol on 28th april the third regiment reached the front at the end of may 1944 in early june the main force of the second and third battalions under shanwas was called up to kohima to reinforce the japanese garrisons in that area which were hard pressed by the counter attack of the british forces between february and may 1944 
the INA had crossed into Indian soil in the Arakan sector and Bishanpur in the Imphal sector. The 4th Regiment moved up as far as Mandalay but could not make its way to the front because of lack of transport and other difficulties created by the rains. The regiment was later given a fighting role along the Irrawaddy River only after INA's failure in the Imphal campaign and the subsequent retreat. The reinforcement group was also brought up to Mandalay and stayed there throughout the fighting in Manipur. But the intelligence group under Lieutenant Colonel Shokat Malik came up and followed the Japanese division all the way up to Bishanpur in the Imphal plain. The Bahadur group had been spread out all along the front from Kohima in the north to the Kaladan Valley in the south. The suicide squads of intelligence and Bahadur groups commanded by Shokat Ali Malik advanced and were the first to hoist the tricolor flag on the liberated territory of India at Moirang on 18th April 1944. In early March, crossing the almost impenetrable barrier between the Chindwin and the Imphal plains, the Japanese began their main thrusts at Kohima and Imphal. Both sides fought fiercely, but the Japanese could not dislodge the defenders, though they nearly did so at Kohima. The British aim was to break the ring around Kohima and achieve a link-up with the beleaguered Imphal. The Japanese efforts, on the other hand, were directed to capture Imphal and its supply dumps before being driven from Kohima. The contest by the end became uneven. The British could bring more troops as reinforcement by rail and road up to Kohima from Assam and keep them regularly supplied. Their fourth corps, fighting in the Imphal plain, was being reinforced and maintained through virtually uninterrupted air operations. The 5th and the 7th British Indian Divisions, which made a decisive difference to the fighting around Imphal, had been airlifted from the Arakans. This development was not originally taken into account in the plans of the Japanese. The Japanese forces and the INA were almost completely cut off from their supply bases 100 to 200 miles away, as there was no all-weather road in between. It was clear that unless they captured Imphal with its supply dumps and destroyed the British 4th Corps, they would either fall back or perish. This was becoming more and more difficult with the passage of time, even falling back during the height of the monsoon season with the troops already emaciated and exhausted was a hazardous venture. The troops of the 1st INA Division was on reduced rations from the beginning of June and were slowly starving. For the 10 days before the withdrawal, which started on 18 July, there was only a handful of dal supplemented by roots and leaves of edible halves and trees. And for the last three days, even the dal was not available. All that the men could get was a small portion of ground condiments, mainly red chilies and salt, still left over from the tinned stuff captured from the British Indian supply dump months ago. This stuff was issued so that men could have taste of some sort in their mouths to keep them going. By May 1944, it became clear to Lieutenant General Kawabe from what he had observed in course of his tour of the front that the Imphal campaign had failed. A timely withdrawal which might have saved the Japanese and the INA forces was delayed, mainly because the campaign having been launched under the Southern Army Headquarters order could not be called off by the Japanese Burma Area Army. It was not before 9th July that Lieutenant General Kawabe was in a position to order a general withdrawal with a prior authorization from Field Marshal Tarauchi. A number of reasons have been offered by the participants in the campaigns and historians for the failure of the Japanese and INA. And these reasons range from the change in the global situation, the war situation, the Second World War, the tide was turning and also faulty strategic decisions. As has been pointed out by M. Z. Kiani, that these campaigns were probably two years too late. The time was not 1942 anymore. The situation that was in 1942 had changed drastically. The British Indian Army had got their chance to regroup, to rethink and reinforce their manpower and supplies. Had this campaign been organized in 1942, Kiani rightly points out that there would have been no serious opposition to the entry of the Japanese forces in Assam and Bengal. 
but the situation in 1944 was quite different. The tide of the war was slowly but surely turning in favor of the Allied forces. The Japanese plan was brilliant. They hoped to pin down the British forces in the Arakan sector, get the reserves into that sector and then attack, go around and attack the Imphal sector separately. But then there were some strategic decisions by the Japanese military leaders which later came on under intense scrutiny and one of those strategic decisions was not to attack Dimapur. Dimapur which was the nearest railhead and supply base, if that had been captured, the fall of Imphal was practically assured but the Japanese never made any effort to capture Dimapur which was crucial but less defended. At one point, Mutaguchi wanted to attack Dimapur, but that order was countermanded by his superior Kawabe. One reason for this lack of thrust towards India by capturing Dimapur was the Japanese hesitation of committing resources because they were already fighting a very critical stage of battle in the Pacific against the Americans. So they were in two minds whether to commit more manpower and air power to this part of the war. As a result, the thrust of the Japanese attack was just around Kohima without trying to capture, instead of trying to capture Dimapur, which would have assured their victory. According to another version, Mutaguchi wanted to hold on to Kohima until the fall of Imphal and that's the reason why he didn't go ahead to capture Dimapur. Apart from these strategic decisions and overall war situation, one very interesting story comes out from Colonel G. S. Dillo. He wrote, Our forces cut off Kohima Road and threatened Silchar and Dimapur. We were virtually knocking at the very gates of the fortress of Imphal. The 14th army of the enemy was at the verge of surrender. Actually, they had decided to surrender. It was at this crucial stage that two of our important officers, Major Prabhu Dayal and Major J.B.S. Grewal, not being able to endure the thirst and hunger any longer, went over to the enemy. Prabhu Dayal became a brigadier in Free India while General Grewal was murdered by some of his men after India attained independence. It was from these two deserters that the enemy learned that the INA and the Japanese were in a poor state in respect of food and ammunition. At such a crucial juncture, order went to the 14th British Indian Army to postpone their surrender. The 5th Division was dropped into Imphal to reinforce the fortress from the air. Therefore, the question arises, did the INA lose the battle because of betrayal? That's a big question. The Japanese were forced to give up the sieges at Kohima and Imphal. They decided that they had to retreat now. Netaji, however, resisted. He said that he wanted his men to stay back and fight till the end. However, he had to accept the reality. But he instructed his men to fight the enemy while retreating as well as they could. The retreat was drawn out through the better part of the year and went on till the early 1945. Netaji believed that the failure of the INA was primarily due to the failure of the Japanese. Their lack of sharing arms and ammunition, food and medicine, transport facilities and lack of air power. The failure of Hikari Kekan to keep the INA supplied with ration and other logistical necessities cost them very dear. Realizing the danger of depending wholly on the Japanese for supplies, Netaji now tried to take new steps, new measures. He decided to set up a war council to look into the requirements for a future war. He came to realize that the Hikari Kikan was actually of no real value. Rather, it was a nuisance standing between him and the Japanese government. Despite the defeat, despite the retreat, Netaji kept up his activities to keep the spirits high. With his defeats coming in, the Tojo government had resigned. Netaji left for Tokyo towards the end of October 
to meet with the new government. With him went M. Z. Kiani and A. C. Chatterjee. The new government under General Kaiso was also as favorable, as receptive as was the government under Tojo. This visit to Tokyo made it clear to Netaji that the the war was lost, that the Japanese was on the verge of defeat, and that they were not in a position to provide as much help as he would like them to. And this triggered his forward planning. He was formally told by the Japanese in mid-April 1945 that the Imphal campaign was over and that the British forces were very close and that he should move out of Rangoon. Netaji refused to leave Rangoon until, his, until he could make sure that his forces could retreat safely. He wanted to be with his retreating soldiers and not leave them behind. After much persuasion by the Japanese and by his own senior officers, he agreed to leave Rangoon and left the town three days after the Japanese had left. His objective now was to continue the struggle from Malay, to reinvigorate INA, to raise the bigger army that he had planned to and continue the struggle. But even during this stage, his overwhelming concern was the safe evacuation of the Rani of Jhansi regiment and the retreating soldiers. But it was also clear to him that it was time to explore alternatives, that probably this theatre of war was not going to achieve what he desired, that is India's freedom and he was looking for another front. And it was from this time that his search for the new front began, which led to his mysterious disappearance in 1945. For what happened from this point onwards, to know about that, I recommend that you see the series on Netaji's trail, which is available on this channel. Yet another controversial topic is whether the INA surrendered to the British troops, to the Allied forces after Netaji's departure. The answer is no, the INA did not surrender and for that we have uh, the order of the day issued by M. Z. Kiani, whom Netaji instituted at the head of the Azadin government after his departure. So the order which was passed by M. Z. Kiani was to cease fighting. It was not to surrender. So the INA stopped fighting. That's all. They did not go and surrender to the British. So the story of the INA proper ends here. But another phase began when they were brought back to India. The post-war activities of the INA and its impact constitutes a very big episode of modern Indian history, which is not discussed in detail, which is not well known. So after this, we will be looking into the INA trials, how the INA soldiers were put up on trial, how they were treated and their impact on Indian politics, how the INA catalyzed Indian independence. That's what we will look into in our next episode in the INA series. Till then, goodbye. Jai Hind.